Hi, in this episode I'll be talking to my friend Ramva Yormanton. She talks about her work in Scandinavia for Shearwater and Fourth Element. Over a brew, Ramva tells me about her upcoming expedition to Mexico with Robbie Schmittner and the Zuhan Ha project. That's the hardest word I've ever had to try and say. Do you fancy a brew? Uh, so, how's it going? You had a good day? Yeah, very good, thank you. I've uh, just got back from holiday and starting to get back into things. Really? Where have you been? I've uh, been back home on the Faroe Islands. Nice. Was it good? Did you have a good it time? Yeah, it's always great to go back and see family. Managed yeah. to get a couple of dives in as well, which is uh, awesome. Oh, no. Nice one. Tell me about the Faroe Islands. Um, so the, the Faroes, obviously, is, is a very small town community. It's 50,000 people. Yeah. Um, a small space as well. So it's 100 kilometers from north to south. Um, wow. So and quite religious as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. And growing up there was just it was amazing. As a like, as a child, you just run out the door and say, "Bye, mom, I'm going out to play." Yeah. And then yeah. Uh, she's like, "Don't go out. Don't be late for dinner." <laughs> and then, uh, just uh, we used to race ac- across the cliffs as kids, or like stand out fishing with the little fishing rods. Mega. Just, just growing up in nature like that. Sounds better than Wigan, where I'm from. A land of missed opportunity, I think. Oh. But I guess not. I guess quite big communities like that. You know, it's kind of. In, indoctrinated in us to work in industry isn't it and and that kind of stuff rather than perhaps the outward bound sort of life um yeah. so I'm, I'm quite envious when i speak to a lot of people on here to be fair whether it be where they had the first dive or where they're from or where they're living now like are you down in cornwall yeah yeah so, I'm in cornwall. you know we used to holiday there as kids you know we go go down for a fortnight every summer holidays and yeah. I'd, I'd be like, I don't want to go home. I, I want to stay yeah. down here because this is the kind of life I want to live. Carmel, Carmel is amazing. I love everything about it, except how difficult it is, is to get in and out of. Yeah. So we, we had a five and a half hour drive back down from Stansted Airport. Uh, like home, 2 a.m. Like, oof. That's yeah. a, bit, it's a bit harsh, isn't it? Yeah, it's a price you have to pay for living in Cornwall. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I, I, I mean, I've been home from work an hour or two, but I've not had my dinner or... My wife oh, tends no. to sit downstairs cooking or waiting for me to come down and then we'll get on with whatever. <laughs> yeah, I got my partner quietly um, folding laundry next to him. He's about to get out of the house as soon as he's done. <laughs> he's got him well trained then, folding laundry. Yeah, yeah. That's ace. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> he doesn't agree. <laughs> <laughs> is he listening? Yeah. He is. Hiya, mate. <laughs> well done. <laughs> so how do I pronounce your name? Is it Ramva? Yeah. Just straight out of Yeah. I I was because I've done um, all the editing up to your episode that we're filming now. And at the end of each episode, I'll say, right, this is the end of episode 21, and with whoever, and next episode is with whoever. And obviously, me not being Scandinavian, don't really know how to pronounce some of them letters. So I'm trying to Google <laughs> how to pronounce your surname. Oh, you should have seen me. It was horrendous. Uh, I bet. <laughs> I'm not, don't ask me to do it because I'll I, mess it up. Oh no, it's all right. I, I, I have like, I started signing my last name up without like any of the funny letters now because yeah. it's like my name's confusing enough as it is. Well, it's funny, isn't it? This, that's, that's, that's the nature of people being from all around the world, isn't it? Which is, is kind of cool, I guess. So Ramva, welcome to Fancy A Brew podcast. Um, if you'd like to give us a little bit of an introduction to yourself, don't give too many spoilers away. And then we'll, we'll just see where it goes from there. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, well, yeah, obviously, my name is Ranma Jermansson. Um, I'm from the Faroe Islands. I am 32 years old. Uh, I currently live in Falmouth in Cornwall. And I work for Fourth Element and uh, for Shearwater as well. Or I'm the Scandinavian and Baltics uh, sales rep for Shearwater. I do a bit of cave diving, do a bit of rebreather diving, do a bit of instructing. Just anything that's got anything to do with diving, really. <laughs> Better than my job, I guess. So what brew are you drinking? Have you got a brew? I I literally just finished my cup of coffee. Oh, terrible. <laughs> I cheated. I'm very sorry, but I have a <laughs> glass of water that I got ready. <laughs> well, that's all right, isn't it? So when was the last time you in the water? Um, Saturday. Yeah. Whereabouts? Anywhere good? Anywhere exotic? I, yes, actually. It was in the Faroe Islands. I've just come back from holiday. I was diving with uh, one of my very good friends back home. Um, he's got a dive center called North Atlantic Diving. He's just started it. And we were diving in this amazing crack in the Faroe Islands there, which is just, oh, 
like mind blowing. There's so yeah. much light. And I even managed to see a puffin swimming underwater. No way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It came twice. That's like, nice. Yeah, I got a, I got a pretty good. I have a little video where you can't really see the puffin, but you can hear me squeal. <laughs> well, we were diving, um, a couple of mates of mine who run another podcast, um, we went to Stony Cove, sort of in the Midlands, a couple of weeks ago, and there was a duck, just a normal duck, and it was diving down. It's the first time I've ever seen a, a bird underwater. We weren't in the water, we were above though on the car park, and it was going really deep and bringing up some pond weed and just eating it on the, or faffing with it on the surface. But I couldn't imagine what it'd be like to see one underwater. It must be pretty, whoa, where have you come from? <laughs> Especially, but there were so many fish as well, but just where I was diving as well. I was diving with a friend who was doing macro photography. Yeah. So I was more or less just like kind of swimming in circles, making sure like didn't lose her and then just having a good time, a good look around. There were so many fish where we were. And then suddenly a school of them got a bit scared. Yeah. And you're like, oh, I wonder if they're a different kind. And then this weird animal comes <laughs> flying over. And you're like, no, surely not. And then you manage to see that the very uh, distinctive beak. Yeah. <laughs> they must be really good because in I've seen them sort of stood on cliffs and they've got like a mouth full of sardines or whatever it is. Yeah. Loads of them, haven't they? So they must be able to just open the beak a bit and get another one and then another one and then just they rack them all up and that. Yeah, yeah, it circled twice. Like it came down, yeah. and then I saw it. And my friend, she, she said that it was her dream to see a puffin. And yeah. I told her like that. I, that probably won't happen. Don't set your hopes too yeah. high. So I managed to turn around and speed over and get her and kind of get her back. And then it circled and it came back again and took an even closer look at us again. Oh, it was just incredible. But her taking macro photography would have had the the wrong lens on and have been devastating. Yeah. Unless yeah. she's, has she got wet lenses or has she got like an internal one with a port? No, she's got the big, uh, oh. the big one, yeah. But it was like, I had the little GoPro, I managed to get a little bit of a, That's cool. of a picture, but yeah. I think just seeing it was, uh, was incredible enough. So the Faroe Islands, how sort of lo- big of a flight is that from, from the UK? Is it quite, quite a long flight or? Uh, it's not too bad actually, like you can fly direct from Edinburgh. I just don't know um, where it is now. Yeah, it's not yeah. so bad, is it, really? It's only it's only probably yeah. far as south of France, really, isn't it, looking at my yeah, map behind Yeah, it's only us. a couple of hours. Yeah. So, yeah, about two hours, if that. From uh, from Copenhagen, it's enormous, the uh, closest hub. Right. And that's, uh, there. you got, what, two or three daily flights from Copenhagen, and that's two hours. So. so there's no direct flights, is there not? Do you have to sort of uh, do yeah, transfers? So we, yeah, Copenhagen first, and then the Faroes. Mm. What's your summer like there? Is it okay? <laughs> <laughs> Face says it all. Uh, well, it can be, but it's like it also can't be at all. We did have like uh, we did have all sorts of weather in like in the span of two days, and then it changed. Like then it went over again. Um, so it comes from windy to stormy to sunny to almost snowy, and then fog comes in, right. and then it's sunny again. Uh, so it just changes so rapidly and so quickly. You just need to prepare for all kinds of weather when you're out. Yeah. So it's one of them, isn't it? If it's not raining, it will be in a bit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sometimes my mom just calls me up to tell me that the roads are dry. Yeah. She has to do that for a while. <laughs> <laughs> Mega. Is it, so it's quite exposed then? Yeah. Yeah. It's very exposed. Mm. I mean, we had, uh, we had two years ago, there was this massive storm back home. And like, if I remember correctly, a Hurricane 5 has got gusts of 37 meters per second. Okay. We had a wind station back home that recorded a gust of 93 meters per second. And then the wind station broke. Okay. So Sounds like yeah, a bullet, so we, doesn't it? That's horrendous. <laughs> Imagine being in that. Yeah, no. Like, but I mean, all the houses are very sturdily built. Yeah. And architecture and stuff. Like you have to build them about three times uh, stronger than normal. Yeah, but, uh, but yeah, weather controls all back on. Sounds sounds like a decent reason to move over to the uh, to the the southwest coast of England. Then, so yeah. what prompted you move? I mean, I'm assuming you were into the outdoors and diving well before you moved over here. Yes, I was. I actually uh, I came over because of my job at Fourth Element. To be perfectly honest, I had no idea where Cornwall was when I when I applied for the job. Wow. <laughs> So uh, I thought, right, well, actually, well, when I saw the job post, I, I did have a Google before I applied, to be honest. Yeah. And I thought it looked nice, and I wasn't entirely sure whether or not I was going to get the job. Um, 
because mainly I want I, I knew I wanted to do something with diving. Um, I wasn't sure I wanted to be a full time instructor, um, but I no. definitely wanted to do something with diving. So then I saw that Fourth Element um, was hiring, and I absolutely love the brand, always have. And uh, and I know and I knew Jim and and Paul from uh, Dima show the year before. Right. And I thought, wow, they seemed like very good bosses as well. So I took a shot and applied. Uh, however, the job was for a, a dry suit repair technician and serve a customer really? service manager. Yeah. But the the thing was, I had no idea how to repair dry suits, and I <laughs> thought, I'm sure I can learn on the job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just went to work for Four Filament. Nice. So uh, I didn't get the job. No. Uh, clearly, because I didn't know how to repair dry suits. <laughs> but uh, but luck would have it that they were actually looking for someone to do sales in the Scandinavian regions. And obviously, my language capabilities came into place there. So I got another job instead. Okay. How many languages can you speak? Uh, I am fluent in Faroese, Danish and English. I understand Norwegian and Swedish because they're very closely related to Danish. <laughs> I have a little bit of German. Um, and a, a smidgen of Chinese. <laughs> really? Yeah. Wow. What what prompted the Chinese? Well, I did study uh, Chinese and economics in Copenhagen. Right. <laughs> for a couple of years, I didn't finish it because it was <laughs> extremely difficult. But I did do that for about two years in Copenhagen. No. Do you come from that sort of sales background? Then is that how two things came together? Uh, not 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 exactly sales, but customer service. I would say. Yeah. I, um, my my my, what I started out as was um, was a bank. Uh, what's the word in the English? Like uh, financial advisor, I okay. guess. Yeah. Um, so I was a trainee in a bank in the Faroe Islands. However, I was working in the bank from the village where I was from. So it was two and a half thousand people were lived there, yeah. and it was pretty weird advising friends and family about mortgage. <laughs> and, and if the yeah. account was in overdraft and stuff like that. <laughs> I, I, um, what, what happened the other day? Oh, somebody paid me for a job, but did a screenshot of the payment that they'd done via the bank transfer. But it, it also had like the bank balance and how overdrawn they were. And I thought I would have like at least seen that and maybe put a red line through it. So it's a bit embarrassing if you know them. I, I, I don't have a clue who they are. It's just somebody I work for. But yeah, yeah I should imagine. Dealing with people on a personal level with their finances is quite personal, isn't it? So it must be a bit of an odd, it an odd is, thing. It is, it is. And then, like, when the guys wanted to buy you a drink and then they remembered that I was their bank advisor and, like, <laughs> their account was an overdraft. <laughs> and then they realised halfway through, uh, like, oh. It's almost like you're buying them a drink, isn't it, then? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're going to be telling them off on Monday for it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so where did you sort of dive in? Um, career let's use that as a loose term your your love for diving or how did you get into diving where did that start um I guess like I guess it really like diving itself started when I was backpacking in Australia in 2008 um I was I was having a gap year and I was traveling around and I was kind of you know typical backpacker like taking boxes along the way like skydiving thick yeah. Uh, river rafting pick and then I'd seen Finding Nemo and like I was close to the Great Barrier Reef and I thought okay that's another box I need to tick as well yeah um, and and to be honest I was actually quite terrified of anything that was in the water like I was scared of stepping on sea urchins or if the water like if I went too far out I'm sure a shark would come and eat me and stuff like that so uh, yeah it, I just wasn't very brave at it well, I've always been very fond of the water, obviously, growing up in the Faroes, yeah. living close by water and seeing water every day, um, playing down by the fjords and by the cliffs as children. Um, so there's always been a, a curiosity of what, what's in there. Um, and then I just took the diving course and the pool bit was kind of easy because we've always swam a lot back home. So I was confident in the water. It was more like it was the fear of what's in it. Yeah. And then uh, remember going out to the Great Barrier Reef, like we were, like from my, my open water course, I did a three day liverboard. So I started at the top, I guess. Yeah. And then I remember having getting the mask on and being able to look for the first time and see what's actually there. And then that that's that's also where that feeling came of being weightless. And I just like oh, it was just instant love. Mm-hmm. And um, and then I also remember being sat with the other divers and instructors listening to their stories and thinking 
I want to have cool stories like that to tell one day. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I remember being so inspired by these people as well, and like all the cool stuff that they've yeah. done, seen and stuff. And I, I remember wanting, oh, yes, I would like to be someone like that one day. I've said this to almost everybody that I've had on now, that everyone who I seem to interview has either had a better first dive than me or has done. <laughs> so you, in the Great Barrier Reef, again, I'm like devastated because mine yeah. was in not in the Great Barrier Reef, it was in Tenerife, off a beach, yeah, and they sort of sell you the dream, so we went snorkeling in the morning, and then a dive in the afternoon where somebody's literally got all you all the way around, doing your inflation, and I kind of felt like I was on my own, and I didn't enjoy it at all, and, and obviously another 14 years later it took me to get to the point where I could get into diving, and then... Oh, really, what, what got you back into it? Four years ago, I was in an office in, in, our, in our unit, and there was a bloke in there and we just got chatting and it was literally over a brew. So I'd, I was doing some work, he was doing some work. And as I got up to make myself a drink, I said to him, do you want a, do you want a cup of tea? I'll, I'll get us all one like, and uh, he said, yeah, go on then. So as I brought it back in, he started a bit of a chit chat saying, uh, so what do you do? What are you into? And then he said, I'm going on a dive expedition to Fortaventura to look at the, angel, the migratory and breeding patterns of angel sharks. And I said, mate, do I fancy scuba diving? I've always wanted to, never really had the opportunity to where I can take it on. So I'd love to, tell me what I need to do. That was sort of my initial concept for getting me into diving was to go on this expedition. It was only five days, but it was, you know, it was the best five days of my diving life because yeah. I, I was so new and naive and, and wide-eyed to everything that was coming my way. That sort of sponge and thirst for knowledge, you know. Yeah. Um, and it, it opened me up to a world of possibilities and meeting new people such as you. So obviously you, you've moved over to the UK, you're working for Fourth Element and you've picked up loads of different diving quality. So you've gone from just being an open water diver and whatnot. So where was your transition then into more technical diving? Um, so I was after, um, after Australia, I went back home to the Faroes and did my bank training and stuff. Yeah. And I, I became I became a dive master while I was out in my back, back uh, gap here as well. Because really? I was like, yeah, I, I absolutely loved it. So from my open water and then six months after, I, I become a dive master. And I took, Jeez. yeah, I did my dive master in Anguilly Triangle out in Bali, which was, uh, yeah. <laughs> I hate you already. <laughs> <laughs> That was good fun. However, I feel like I started the reverse way because then right. I came back to the Faroe Islands. I had and I became I got introduced to dry suit diving. Hmm. Back then there weren't really dry suits for females back home. It was neoprene suits. They were my first dry suit dive. And I was I was actually diving with a mate as well. And he's like, nah, it's fine, I'll take you diving. There's a nice little bay here. It wasn't very deep, like eight meters and yeah. It's a little kelp fur, it's was really, really cool. And then I showed him my neck, and I'm like, is this supposed to be this loose? And he's like, yeah, yeah, it's fine. Like, okay. <laughs> and you have like so much when you're not, when you're not, when you're female, you just have lots of smaller shoulders. So there's, I couldn't even get my own BCD on because everything just crinkled. Yeah. We jumped in, and I just like whoosh immediately. Could feel all the water running in. Horrendous. Oh god, this is horrible. And then we did a bit of a dive around. I think like 10, 15 minutes. It got heavier and heavier to swim, and I got colder and colder. And then I poked my buddy like, "I'm a little bit cold now. Can you please go out?" <laughs> he's like, "Ah, you'll be fine. Just keep on swimming." I'm like, "Okay." <laughs> and then we kept on swimming for another 10 minutes. I'm like, "No, no, no, no. I can't do it anymore. I'm shaking and controlling now. Let's go up." Mm. And then he's like, why do you want to go out already? I'm freezing. Yeah. And I opened my dry suit and then took the water out and it just like gushed out. And his eyes, oh, I'm so sorry. I thought it just leaked a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, uh, fortunately for me, I had some very persistent friends that kept pulling me back and back into diving. And yeah. then we solved that with some rubber bands and some gaffer tape. Yeah, so I've, I've seen that done every time. A load yeah. of parcel tape around their neck. I've seen yeah. that done before. Yeah, but it was just, it was a horrible way of starting dry suit diving. It mm. really was. So I like, I almost stopped diving because of that experience. Yeah. Um, but again, thanks to my very persistent friends back home who kept pulling me back and encouraging me to come and dive again and again. I kept coming back and you and got more and more good experiences. 
and then I moved to Denmark. And in Denmark, I eventually became a diving instructor and worked for a dive shop called Kingfish. And that's where I got my first proper dry suit, my first made to measure dry suit. I was like, oh my God, this is just amazing. And since then, I don't think, I can't remember diving wetsuits since. No. And that's about it is ridiculous, isn't it? <laughs> having one that's absolutely tailor-made for you. Yeah. It's so much better in every single way. It really is. It really is. And especially, I'm very tall and I have um, and skinny uh, wrists and neck. Yeah. Um, but quite small shoulders. So it's, I had to have something that was tailor-made. Mm -hmm. um, but talking about how I got into technical diving, um, so obviously I was in Copenhagen with these other instructors there and in winter we would have um, pool time instead of going out because in Denmark the water very quickly comes down to zero degrees, Yeah, it's mm -hmm. absolutely freezing. Um, I remember doing my rescue, um, rescue assessment for our IDC where my buddy was wearing heavy duty dry gloves and having to pinch my nose consistently. I was just red raw at the end of it. <laughs> Horrible. You know, and they're shaking. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but so during pool sessions in the winter where we could go and like do our open water sessions and just practice, the guys, yeah. you'd see some of the guys practice their technical skills over in the corner. Either yeah. they were doing like ascents and descents or they were doing shutdowns and stuff like that. And, and I always look quite fun. And uh, you go over and ask them questions about why they're doing that. And then they still like start encouraging you and telling you why they're doing all these things. And, and that was kind of my gateway into it. Right. Uh, but, but really it was, it was cave diving was a bit of, um, uh, of an accident or so it's more of a coincidence. My, my friend, uh, Karina was, is her name. She was on her way, she was going to Florida three months later to do a, her cave diving course. Yeah. Uh, with a friend of hers and they needed a third person for the course and oh. she asked me if I could be the third person right and I'm like ah oh, sure why not and that's how I got into it yeah so had you done any sort of cavern dives before that at all and uh, now cavern diving there is one little one called um Sharma Buddha Beb um right. down by uh down by in the Red Sea um it's just north of not just south of Marcel Marcel Lam, I think. Yeah. And it's um, it's uh, it's not exactly a cave dive, but it's a cavern dive where you can where you can always see the lights. But that was the first experience I really had of it. Yeah. And it was just absolutely amazing, just having that feel of going through. And mm. there was one spot where was that was proper dark, but uh, yeah, it was awesome. While you're on, I'm I'm going to pick your brains if you don't mind about cavern diving because I've been invited to one in the UK, it's in the North, in North Wales um, in September, and it looks okay. And the only caverns that I knowingly have been in are in Malta, so it's beautifully warm water, crystal clear. You know, how sort of, how much planning and prep should you really t make and, and do for a cavern dive? I mean, I'm not talking cave diving at all, because I'm not cave qualified, but just, yeah. you know, if you're just gonna go into a cavern, should you be thinking about lining in? Should you be really picking your buddies? You know, should you be really conscious of your fin techniques? What do you think? Um, it depends on the cavern as well. Like the one we did in Egypt, there was like, there was no silt on the bottom. The dark spots, I had a line installed already and right. we had a guide. Yeah. So I think, I think being, being quite, um, being comfortable in the water, as I assume you must be as well, yeah, yeah. Um, and and being aware of, of where your body is. Um, mm. Obviously, cavern uh, you can do cavern uh, recreationally as well, so so you should be fine as long as, as do you do you have anyone who knows the site? Yeah, so, so the guys that have asked me to go um, have dived it before. Yeah, it's not massive. It's about eighteen meters deep. Um, there's videos on YouTube, you know, so we can see it and mentally mm. sort of prep for it. it we've got landowners permission to go on it um mm. you know so i don't think it's too much out of my comfort zone and mm. certainly with the qualifications i've got i am you know okay going in there um mm. and it's more on a personal level you know if if there's anything i could pull from you that yeah. i might not have thought about already i was um, asking do you know what kind of uh, bottom composition is this is there a lot of sediment at the bottom i without looking at the well Looking at the video we seen on YouTube this morning, and the di the divers that were in that video, 
the way they were thinning, you would suggest there's not a lot of silt. Yeah. Um, and it's certainly, it, obviously, it's made of rock around yeah. it. And it almost looks like something that was a mine at some point. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of sort of broken rock on the deck. Um, but without, I mean, I'm go we're going to have a good chat this weekend about it and sort yeah. of develop the planning. For my own yeah. peace of mind, you know, I, I like the planning stages of it. Yeah. Um, it quite interests me. And certainly the first one that I will have done that I'll have planned. So I'd like to get quite involved in it. Um, yeah. I think there's three of us, so it's a proper team effort rather than just 20 of us go into a dive site like you would with a group of mates. Yeah. Um, so it, it does quite interest me. Um, I mean, I would... I would definitely because often like you you still you've heard of people having accidents and even in cavern dives as well yeah. and often when that happens it's because they've kicked up the silt and lost visibility so even though what in full vis might have been a simple and easy dive yeah. it's very quickly to get extremely disoriented if you lose visibility yeah so uh, I would probably lay a line if there's not one in already um, and yeah. just so you have something that you can guide you back out um, I don't know if you've done any training with line diving before as well, but, but I would recommend practicing that outside. I have, and I'll be completely honest, because I think that's what's good about this kind of podcast is talking through different things that maybe less experienced divers might not have thought about, but might be just going doing willy-nilly. Um, yeah. I have done line laying as part of one of my qualifications, but not for a while. Yeah. Um, so I'm more than happy the next time I'm in the water to start doing that and, and put, you know, paying it out and getting used yeah. to tying off and keeping the line tight as well. And, and, yeah. and all the things that go with that. Yeah. I, you probably, you probably should get an instructor to teach you like the, the do a little course, a cabin course or yeah. an cavern to, to do that. So just, just maybe you're comfortable as well, but you don't know, or I guess, I don't know what kind of skills your buddies are at as well. Mm. So you might be comfortable, but they might not be, and they might get quickly disoriented. Yeah. Uh, so it's just to build confidence in the Absolutely. skills of all three of you. Where did you find your, your need for a rebreather? Oh, who doesn't need a rebreather? <laughs> <laughs> my missus. Need a my missus life. doesn't need one, <laughs> so she says. <laughs> oh, God. I, I'm a bit of a gadget freak as well. Yeah. And my rebreather is just the ultimate gadget. Um, and it's just, it's just more of... It's just... It's just another level of diving as well. It's another way of diving. And even though I've, I've done quite a bit now rebreather diving, it's, I still find it very challenging because open water, I can, I'm, I can just, sorry, open circuit, I mean, it's, it's just second nature to me. Yeah. But doing it with rebreather, there's so much else that you need to, that you need to keep your mind on, you keep, need to keep focus on. But it's just, it's still, it's just fun as well um, mm -hmm. with the gadgets. Um, the, the need for for my rebreather um, was because we were doing a project last year, me and Maria Bollerup from Denmark. Um, we did a film called Unexplored, which is which is a little film uh, intended to to show what cave diving can be to a wider audience. Right. Um, so for that, we were working with five. Uh, of the major brands in, in diving. So we had Fourth Element, we had Apex, we had Shearwater, um, we had Paralens, and, which was the initiator of this project. And then we had IQSub, which, uh, which makes the XCCR. And so they were very clever and lent us the rebreathers, or like Maria had her own XCCR to begin with. She's got yeah. a modified yeah. version because she's very small. Okay. Um, but they lent me mine and for the project. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was clever of them. I'm, uh, I'm very poor now. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was just uh, doing the training with it as well. Obviously, I did my course with Mark Powell. I wanted to cross over for the rebreather with Mark Powell. Before. I had Mark on a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, I saw. I saw. He's got some good stories, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then, so, so obviously, so that was about... I don't remember like six six months before and yeah. then uh, did training back home and got used to the rebreather and then we were on it was part holiday in mexico with a big group of friends of ours yeah. and then yeah. the last four or five days me and maria was shooting this project and it was with the rebreathers in, in, in mexico and we're about to see mexico were you pardon we're about to see mexico uh tulum yeah that's where we're, yeah. we're we're off there on holiday in december Hopefully. No way. Yeah. 
So are you going to do the do the caves then? You well, need you need to. Yeah. So I've already spoke to Claire Vogel. You know Lanny and Claire. Yeah. So I spoke to Claire a few times over the last year or two, because my inspiration, Steve, who got us into diving, is a cave diver. So there's, there's, we've probably got quite a few mutual friends, um, and the guy who taught me side mount, Gary Dallas. Yeah. He. <laughs> <laughs> he. Obviously, he goes to cave camp every year, and I've kind of fancied the idea of it. Um, Ali, my wife, not so much, perhaps. So I figured, let's go on holiday. Let's go and have a, a real nice break at the end of the year, because, well, that's if we can get there, if this COVID rubbish doesn't ruin it. Uh, but like I said, I spoke to Claire, and we've, we've kind of booked a few days to go on like a guided cavern dive, yeah. which, which hopefully will get Ali, my wife, to get the same bug and just go, let's have it, let's have a go. Um, yeah. So we, there's no formal course. There's, you know, no. it's not going to kill us this, you know, this fortnight away. We're going for an actual break, mm -hmm. um, but to enjoy that break and do some some diving, because um, I'm sure you know, you go on proper dive holidays. It's relentless, isn't it? Day after day after day after day. You do Almost, get very tired when you. Uh, do yeah, you, long co you come back needing a holiday, don't you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the plan would be spend a couple of days in Tulum, a couple of days with underwater Tulum, and then another yeah. couple of days of the two weeks just chilling out and, and then, you know, actually recharging the batteries. I'm getting on now. I'm 40. And yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of recharging to be done here. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that, that's the plan. Um, and they do look phenomenal, and it's kind of warm and all the rest of it. So I think if there's ever going to be a place I can get her into the idea yeah. of it. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's just even like and even if she doesn't actually want to go cave diving it's still going to be an amazing experience but yeah. there's there's nowhere else where you get that light coming through at the entrances and and yeah. even even if you only like the, it's, st it's still a cavern dive it's it just feels like a proper cave dive as well mm -hmm. some of the some of the places you can go in and you like you literally swim around the corner i think i can't remember if it's 30 meters or see, you can't you have to see daylight or something? What's what's the uh, definition of cave diving? Oh, it's, it's isn't it um, within forty meters of an entrance? Yeah. All the extremes of light, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. But I remember there's ones where we where we did for a longer when we went for a longer dive. The name the name eludes me right now. Yeah. But there, there, we saw quite a few of cavern divers that were following this line, and and it got proper dark, but it was still only. 40 meters to each exit and yeah. the, the line was very like clearly marked and you get the hollow climb in there as well mega which is just uh, uh, uh mind mind -boggling. Mind -boggling. <laughs> yeah so much fun hey I, I think i got one in malta in that that cave uh, in that cavern i was on about we swam right to the back and i can't describe it in any other way that i almost got this blurred vision as i went through the water yeah but there was there was, um, there was a great big conga just cutting around there so i was trying to get my gopro like right up to it <laughs> but then my vision was going blurred now i either had something going wrong in my head <laughs> or I was, and it wasn't very deep so i clearly wasn't not yeah. but i can only think because it was into the sort of the rock formation of the bay we were in it must be fresh water coming through that yeah. into the water where we were at and i've just swam through it and not realized that it might be a helicline yeah yeah no it's it's crazy yeah. Crazy when it happened, especially the first time I experienced it in Mexico as well. We didn't know how to position us, <laughs> so I was swimming right behind my friend all the time, and I literally I could just see the light sort of, and you're like, okay, I'm, yeah. I'm sure she's there, and then just kind of following <laughs> along. Yeah. And then after a while, you start feeling a bit woozy, and then and then the, the that passage we were in kind of opened up, and I went a bit to the side, and then it cleared up. And you're like, oh, yeah. I'm just swimming right in her slips the stream. I'm such yeah. an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So let's move on to what what certainly ticks my boxes: your expedition work, and obviously you've got one coming up, haven't you? So yeah. go, tell me as much as you can and as much as you want, and I'll just pick holes in well, it and pick pick your brains. Yeah, well, expedition-wise, I like proper expeditions. I haven't done uh, much really. I, I was in Antarctica in January, but that was as uh, an expedition dive master. But it was it was taking a group of divers who'd never dived in Antarctica before. Mm -hmm. uh, so we started. It was with a company called EOS Expeditions, 
yeah. and this group of divers um, wanted to, who, who are very good divers in warm water, but never done anything cold water. Mm. And so we supplied them with fourth element gear and everything that they needed for their expedition. And then I helped train them up in cold water diving and making them proficient for cold water diving. And then we went to Antarctica in January. Unfortunately, um, we had all sorts of things not supposed to happen while we were there. Okay. Um, algae yeah. bloom being one of them, so the visibility was like about a meter. Right. Uh, wow. So we only managed to do two dives, which is a bit of a shame. Um, mm. But but then I've been on loads of, of trips to, yeah, been to Sweden diving mines. I've been up to in Wales diving uh, some of the mines there with um, with Michael Thomas, Rob I, Thomas, uh, yeah, yeah, father and son. I think you probably yeah. come across them. I have, yeah. And, um, and then I've been to Florida a couple of times, diving the caves over there into Mexico. Um, but proper expedition-wise, this will be my proper first one. Yeah. Um, so, so that's very exciting. I haven't done any like I haven't done any exploring before with caves, and I think we're like Maria has, and I think Ellen hasn't, and neither has. Julia, I think we're quite, we're six ladies on this trip. Yeah. Like, let me just start over again with Go for explaining it. What, the, what the trip is. So it's yeah. called the Shunan Ha Expedition. It's, uh, it's an expedition that Robbie Schmidtner has set up. And Robbie Schmidtner himself is probably one of the human beings who has put more, most line in caves uh, on the planet. He's been living in Mexico for the last 20 years and he's explored i don't know how many kilometers of caves over there he does it on his own doesn't he i don't i mean i like solo diving to a degree yeah. you know i do enjoy it it's more more for photography and and certainly within the comforts and confines of my own you know what i can deal with yeah he he pushes that extreme doesn't he yeah. he does he does and he's probably got more experience and, and forgot more about cave diving than, than i'll ever know <laughs> yeah so so he's the one he's the facilitator for for us and he's the one who has found so we got five virgin cenotes that he has pin marked for us that we're going to going to be the first ones to dive and I what he ha he has an idea that there is something called the holbush fracture and the, this fracture um starts at the top of the yucatan peninsula and runs all the way down to belize and if you look at maps and what caves that have been explored, you can see all the vertical cave systems are on the east side of the fracture, okay. but on the uh, on the west sides they're all vertical. So he has a theory that there's this fracture itself is a water brain cave in itself, and right. there's flow uh, in this, and this might have been um, um, a factor in creating all the. The horizontal caves in Mexico. Right. So uh, the five cenotes he's found um, uh, and pinpoint for us, uh, that's what we're going to look and be looking for. We're going to be looking for proof of the whole bush fracture. Well, that is that is the true definition of an expedition, isn't it? Actually going to do. It's not just a holiday. It's actually going somewhere with a purpose to find yeah. answers to whatever question that might be. I'm yeah. pro I'm uh, proper jealous. I'm going to tell you now. <laughs> Um, extremely jealous. Oh, yeah, I've, uh, I was so excited for it as well. Like we we were supposed to go in November, but again, all the Corona stuff and everything, yeah. and we we're looking for sponsorships, and and the, the the sponsors were a bit iffy about going in November, so we decided to push it to February. Hmm. And so so that's that's the main goal at the moment. Um, but other than trying to prove the whole bush fracture, there's there's several different other um, factors of the expedition. One is to 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 bring more knowledge of the of the aquifer on the Yucatan Peninsula to to a wider audience, and it's it's one of the biggest aquifers in the world, and there's so much fresh water underneath there, and it's needed for so many people. But hotels and and commercial um, buildings and stuff, they're not actually aware what's underneath the land yeah. that they're building on, and often they don't want to know because it might make building harder for them. Um, and then there's also the pollutant of all the of all the, the groundwater that's there. And and Robbie himself has even found freshwater caves like kilometers away from the coast into the ocean 
that are connected in back into the aquifer. There's fresh water that runs out from there as well. But even if you pollute kilometers into the land, it's still going to run into the ocean. Yeah. So it's, it's about bringing awareness to this as well. And and then thirdly, now because of the corona more than any any time else, we do need to help, especially down in on the Yucatan Peninsula where the main income is, is tourism. We're trying to, to bring more awareness about tourism and to encourage people to come back and, and help them because they have lost all their income at the moment and uh, and they're struggling and there's no there's no furlough scheme or anything like yeah. that in Mexico. So they are struggling. So anything we can do to help to get them back on their feet um, is what we're trying to do. I think it's, it's quite easy for us to sit here in our nice warm homes with lighting, with cups of tea on tap or whatever even warm water on tap with all yeah. this electronic gadgetry that we've got and and forget about the sort of second and third world that's out there that's just not got anything because yeah. everything stopped it's when you do think about it it's, it's pretty scurvy isn't it that we are so fortunate and just yeah and even like and just for Thelma as well like Obviously, we had to send quite a bit of a few people home on the furlough scheme because obviously there was nobody doing anything for a couple of months. But here in the UK, that has, has really saved our company. Um, we're back up and running nearly 100% now and, and people are, are really discovering backyard diving, which is amazing to see. And, yeah. and now uh, and getting their eyes up for the beauty of UK diving, which is amazing. There's so many yeah. amazing spots diving here. Um, so that's that's a good thing so so fortunately one fourth element is one of the sponsors for our project as well nice. uh, so hopefully hopefully it'll kick off <laughs> so how how is your fundraising going um so we are we fourth element has uh, started let me just see how we're going at the moment there is there is a site that you can log on if you log on to rubbishmitner.com yeah. you can read about the shunanha um on the there's a um, on the left hand side and then there's a gofundme page where you can go in and see it we are still at the beginning so our goal is to um is to get sixty one thousand eight hundred and fifty two dollars so far we have only raised fifteen hundred um we're still working on getting it up to the wider audience as well mm. um so for for the, the the donations that are coming to this expedition will purely be used for expeditions as well, for exploration and for the development of the Shunan High Expedition Series. Because yeah. even though we only go for 14 days and we'll probably discover, or hopefully, yeah. discover kilometers of new passage, there's the Holbosch fracture runs all the way down to the peninsula. So this is, this is really just scratching the surface. And, and all, the, all the funds raised for this expedition will purely go to this expedition or the development of the Shunan Ha series. That's right. um, so when you say the series, I'm assuming then there's plans for further dives or further expeditions. Are they going to be all female ones? Or is there no. a chance for uh, Andy, the, the northern diver, perhaps to develop <laughs> his cave diving experience one day? Yes, I'm sure there is. I'm sure there is. So, so we did take, we were open for applications to get more people to help us and stuff like that as yeah. well. Um, but all the spots have been, uh, have been filled now. Uh, but there is, as I said, it is an expedition series. So yeah. put your name out already, contact, get in touch with Robbie yeah. and then put your name down for, for future expeditions. Um, we're starting now as well as a female team, just because it's never been done before, mm. to the best of our knowledge. Right. Um, so, so that's why as well, we had we had a drink at the Dima show last year. Yeah. Me, Robbie, Maria, uh, Melody. I think I think everyone was there except Tamara. She didn't make it to, to Dima. So right. we all sat down and had a chat about this expedition. And Robbie had this idea and he thought it'd be really cool to create um a whole female expedition team and he will just and he will then offer the support mm. and everything needed so it's very much the sort of a, a term that's being used now like with the girls at scuba movement yeah. you know there's there's a lot more emphasis on a, let's call it a minority because i mean even today i was looking through the analytics of my youtube channel yeah. and it was something like 98 percent male 
Yeah. And then 2.5% or whatever it was, female. Now, yeah. that's an interesting demographic, isn't it? I think. Yeah. That and even, even if you look at the paddy numbers, which are recreational, yeah. you can see that, um, for, if I remember correctly, the 2018 18 numbers were 38% of the certifications were female. So there's still there's still quite a gap there in between, and that's recreational. So mm -hmm. going into technical, we don't even know, and that's yeah. that's part of this this reason of doing this female expedition. It's it's not about creating a like a battle of the sexes, not no. at all. Like we we've all been supported and and held up high by by the men in our lives as well. But it's about encouraging and and showing like if we can do it, so can you. Yeah. <laughs> and, and and making others believe and. and inspire them to come in and do some more of this amazing diving that, that I really should think should be accessible for anyone. And at the end of the day, I've, it's, it's really hard because not to, to blow my own whistle. Like, some people have been saying that they do find what we do inspiring. Mm. And, and, that's, and that's kind of what I like. I like people to find what we do inspiring, not so much as, well, yeah, well, also that, like, not so much like Ramba. Uh, yeah. this, that's 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 very nerve-wracking and that, that <laughs> makes me just well yeah but when people see like what well, actually what we, it is that we're doing and the adventures that they want to have mm. the same adventures of their own yeah that's something i was like yes i can i can help you or push you to that like if anyone has any questions they're always mm. more than welcome to get in touch and, and nice. if you want to do something like that i'm always happy to help brilliant i mean I, when i spoke to sir richard from girls at scuba a couple weeks ago she yeah. She definitely pinned the nail, the tail on the donkey as such, that a lot of what we see or read or watch on the telly is middle-aged men. No, I'm in that demographic now, just turned 40. I know that. So, oh, you're still looking. You look great, Andy. Thanks, mate. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm married. <laughs> oh, okay. and, and you're dead tall and I'm dead short, so it'll never work. <laughs> but anyway, joking aside, um, and it is... Isn't it the market is very much saturated, whether it in on what sort of ever media you look at, yeah. mostly with middle-aged men that have been lucky enough to have a good career that's brought them to the the sort of forefront now. So I think yeah. it is good, whether it be Ellen who's always on Wex Pixel because she takes fantastic photography, or you because you're at the forefront of working for Fourth Element and Shearwater because you know you're doing this sort of technical and more inspirational diving that I would love to do. You know, I'm really envious and will be following you now an awful lot more. You know, so you need so to that, do your course and we'll go diving together. <laughs> well, I need to find time. I've got too many other irons in the fire, but yeah. it'll happen. It just because I've only been diving a few years, I think a rebreather or cave diving right now might just be a little bit too much. You know, you also I'll, need to have something to look forward to as well. Exactly. You know, if you yeah. do it all on the first day. It's yeah. all gone then. You, you, what, what's next? You've not done it. You've nothing else next to do, have you? So, I'm, I'm kind of enjoying where I'm at now. You know, so that's kind of where I'm at with it. So, cave diving will come, I don't doubt, yeah. and and so will a rebreather. But, you know, it's hard enough taking your camera in the water, isn't it? <laughs> I still haven't. Like, I, I use my paralens, but that's yeah. about the extent of my camera feels at the moment i was looking at helene on on saturday and she was diving up and did feel a smidge of jealousy as well and i would like to do that but i think no i'm i'm poor enough because of the rebreather at the moment so <laughs> i have to wait well that was the other thing we, we're in between should we have our bathroom refitted <laughs> or shall i buy myself a go uh, a, not a gopro <laughs> shall i buy myself a rebreather and go on the yeah. course wow so, well, you're very lucky that you have a partner that dives as well and understands yeah. the passion. That's that's often omega sometimes as well. It can be very difficult because it it is time consuming and 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 hard on the wallet. Mm. Does yours dive? Uh, if, and I'm trying to train him, but he's slacking <laughs> a little bit. I think he's taking it a bit too easy because it's uh, oh well. We can just uh, do. Do I really have to do the theory? Yes, you do. Mm. Okay. <laughs> I, I kind of went with um, rather than trying to encourage her to do certain things like we made the transition quite quickly from diving you saw a normal open circuit with an octopus yeah quite well inspired to dive on a wing with a long hose so instead of asking I just bought it for her just fitted oh. it and then let's get in the water and let's pr practice with this and 
Yeah. yeah. We, we, so we dive very much as a team now, me and her, yeah. because our kit is exactly the same to the point our dry suits are the same. You know, wow. uh, everything is bob on and it's absolutely, it works perfect for us because we're now at yeah. the same level. But if I'd have waited yeah. for her to sort of make that change, it would have never come, I don't think. Yeah, exactly. Well, I, I, I do have a little bit of the same idea as well. But it's mainly it's mainly because I I need to get back in the water and get some uh, some training done on my rebreather again as well. Yeah. Like obviously if it's been standing stagnant now for a while. My poor mm. thing, so dusty. <laughs> poor thing. <laughs> yeah, oh, I'm still neglected. Um, yeah. But I, I do need to to have someone with me as well. I, I'm not going to be diving alone on my rebreather, and often it's easier just to get him yeah. than to arrange for all sorts of buddies to come along as yeah. well. Let's jump back onto your expedition bit. Before we before we digress onto everything, because I'm terrible for going off at tangents and not coming back, <laughs> but I have made a list of stuff to go through. I don't know if you can see that with the light. Well, um, so I've planned a couple of, or I've certainly planned a, one proper expedition, and it was a military one. So we had uh -huh. 17 guys and girls on it. There was probably half as much funding to find as what you've got. Yeah. To find, um, and a lot of it came from a mixture of the sort of public purse. So the government or the MOD were paying for it. But other it, I had to try and raise, you know, so I had to raise 15 grand. Yeah. It's no small task alone. And it's just yeah. you, you, you yourself doing it. At least you've got some, some, some buddies and well-known yeah. names to help raise that money. So we didn't yeah. get any sort of proper sponsorship. But how, how hard have you found the planning? So sort of the personnel choices? Um, or have you, have, have you just left it all to Robbie? Has he done it all? I don't know. What's, what's the dynamics with that? To to be perfectly honest, that's all Robbie. Um, yeah. uh, it's all it's all he's handpicked the team. So he's handpicked us six yeah. to be the main divers, and then there's all sort of support that needs to be around as well. I'm I think Chantal Newman is uh, is our medic. Yeah. And we we will need to camp out in the jungle. We will need to bring a compressor. So there will be a lot of of carrying and stuff like that as well. So we we are having a support team with us as well um but it's but it's, it's robbie's turf it's yeah. his backyard yeah. and and it's his personnel uh well i'm not sure if it's his personnel exactly because some there's uh there's people coming on board as well who have applied to be part of it i should imagine it's a really big sort of logistics sort of yeah. echelon behind six people getting in the water yeah you've got yeah. so much you you're not gonna have time to cook and and, and prepare stuff are you properly yeah. not for 14 days no, Sweet. no, no. I'm not sure if we're going to stay out there for 14 days in a row. I think yeah. it's going to be like in, in patches of three to four days, he right. said, just to, to make sure morale doesn't go down. Yeah. Um, so we're going to be driving a bit in and out. And and yeah, but obviously there's there's a lot of teams. So me and Maria will probably be bringing our rebreathers as well. Okay. Uh, I, I know some of the other girls, uh, definitely Tamara, she dives a lot of rebreather too. Um, and then like... It will be what whatever teams. I have a feeling we might be put up in three teams and dive two and two, right. um, just to, to cover as much ground as possible. Mm -hmm. And some of them dive scooters as well. But I haven't done my DPV in caves yet, so I am proper jealous of that. <laughs> <laughs> so they'll be swimming around with their DPVs, but okay. uh, I'll, I'll be using my legs. I saw your face, and obviously this doesn't go out as a video. Even when it goes out on YouTube, it's not a video. But I saw your face when you said about camping out in the jungle. Oh yeah. Is that make you a bit nervous? A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, I don't fancy it at all. No, no. way. Um, so we, we, we are in hammocks as well. So it's, to be honest, I don't, my, my biggest fear is wasps. So that's what I'm worried about. Really? Yeah. Anything else I can handle, but if wasps gets too close, like I, I'll keep my cool. Yeah. But I think like last time me and Maria were in Mexico, we were walking down to the cenote. We had we had this beautiful overhang as well before we even got into the water. And we walked in and she got stung right on the lip. No way. I'm like, oh, I don't want that happening to me. <laughs> well, it's funny you should say that because obviously that's what I do for a living, being a pest controller. Oh so, really? Yeah. Um, and oh, touch wood, <laughs> yeah, touch wood. I haven't been stung this year, but generally I'll be up in loft people's lofts or their attics, you know, pulling out wasp nests and stuff. Ooh. And honestly, I'm as scared in that loft as I would be in a jungle. Oh really? Because I've got a full bee suit on with their big hat and gloves. Oh, yeah. 
but then you've got to wear a couple of layers underneath because the sting's a lot longer and it's so hot as you imagine in the summer it's 20 odd degrees outside it's 50 odd degrees in the loft yeah, and yeah. then and then when you touch that nest it just goes it just goes alive so i know you i know you sort of nerves around the wasps and that but it's all yeah. them creepy crawlies like you can't get away from them that's no, what bugged me yeah i mean like and i do imagine us being being like number one excited enough number two tired enough that yeah. we will fall asleep in the hammocks at night and uh, and the carrying in and out is all is something i'm also a bit mm. we'll see about that but it, it has to be done like yeah. expeditions aren't supposed to be easy no have you have you slept in a hammock before no i haven't oh you need to try it it's amazing it, it is yeah, good right I've done yeah. it. I've done it in Cyprus. We were on some training a few years ago, and yeah. I had the opportunity instead of sleeping on a roll mat on the floor, which was yeah. really dusty, I managed to get a hammock up, and it was it, oh, it was fit. It was so good. You've just got to yeah. kind of be on the right level though, because otherwise you end up bent in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> you fit tight. Yeah, that was one thing I was thinking about, like how that will work, but also that the rocking motion as well. I guess, mm. like I imagine maybe being a bit like on a boat or something. Yeah. So uh, what other prep have you got to do for that other than getting your hours up on your rebreather and Yeah, well so so obviously just getting a lot in the water. Maria is, is planning on coming over here um, and then we'll do some training together. Um really just prepping, like do it like practicing lots of, of lane lying, uh, line laying, I'm sorry. Yeah. And um, like blindfold swimming and, and shutdowns and everything they like they, they already know, but just like just keep on practicing. Getting that skill set uh, yeah. right up there yeah yeah exactly um and when we get there um robbie is going to give us a course in how to survey and make sure that we all dive in the same way as well um, okay. so we're, that's that's the very first thing so we'll, we'll yeah. practice properly before we start diving um, what about in terms of like your physical fitness with obviously the carrying in and out the heat that kind of stuff are you going to try and work on that is that a yeah plan? yeah i did i was really good in the start of lockdown as well so like we've been we've been we've been buzzing around with this project for quite a while so uh, at the beginning of lockdown like that hour that precious hour you yeah. <laughs> were allowed to go outside i did start running and it was just such a it was such um it was such a nice thing for the mind as well just to mm. get out and see some things and that just made lockdown a lot easier so i kind of just got into running and i managed to get a half a half marathon in wow um and but then unfortunately i injured my foot uh, oh. Oh, injuries are the worst aren't they yeah too too much too fast and i should have known better but it was just i never done it before so it's just like oh i just really want to see if i can do it <laughs> no way um and and i did so um so i just need to get back into it yeah and obviously we were, we were starting on crossfit before lockdown as well which right. which is just fun and also mm. quite functional um but yeah but trying to generally just to to get healthy and and fit before going what kind of music do you listen to when you go running oh i just i really i try to choose music with tempo yeah so 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 i just choose uh as playlist on spotify that's got the beats per minute and yeah. then I choose that one and then, then i just shut off and then i just run it is great isn't it you do your mind can just sort of daydream and just relax and yeah my my wife ali she um she tripped over the step last year last summer i think it was in the garden yeah. just bringing some washing in and she yeah. hurt her ankle so she can't run anymore or at the Ever. minute so she got oh, into okay. cycling during lockdown and she's she's really racking up the miles but oh, cool. she finds it just doesn't give the same release as running does uh, you know yeah. even though she'll have music on and stuff it's it's just that you've got to concentrate a little bit more than just letting your head just wander and and, yeah. and go be worried about the cars and everything like that yeah, as well. i suppose yeah yeah i'm fortunately very lucky down here as well like even though we like I, I never took my car anywhere i just literally went out the door and then went for runs and then yeah. like after 10 minutes i will buy the sea and i've been running around like coastal paths and stuff so i've been extremely lucky living where i live during lockdown there was a lot of people doing that though weren't they they put the dog in the car and then drive to somewhere when you could just walk out your door and and walk your dog or run from or cycle from your house yeah. why do you have to go somewhere to do that it's crazy so let's get on to more sort of 
cool stuff for other people to listen to because obviously that was all my stuff about your expedition. I proper love, I'm proper into that, and I'll certainly be looking into it for for future years. But um, so Paralens, I've not had the opportunity to use one yet, um, oh. and certainly my local dive brand, which is Northern Diver, hence the name Andy the Northern yep. Diver. <laughs> um, I believe they're distributing it, and yeah. and it, but like I said, I've never come across anyone with one. Um, so tell me a bit more about it, would you? Because I, I don't know, other than what well, I've seen on. The thing is, though, like the Paralens now, um, so the Paralens camera itself is, is really made for divers, by divers. So yeah. it's a dive camera. And it's just, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's got a depth sensor and a temperature um, sensor in as well. And you can put that on the, um, you can have that overlay on your footage as well. So yeah. you can see exactly. And once you're done diving, um, you can you can download your dive to your app, and then you you get a dive that uh, dive profile, and then you can see exactly where on the dive that you shot the image, right? Yeah. Uh, or the picture, and it's just and it looks like a little torch. Yeah. Uh, and it's got motion, so it's just point and shoot. And it's got wide angle, so it's it's made for people like me who are not too much into photography, or mm. really would like to to capture the moment, or just to get some image back to your friends so you can show. Um, but I know some other people say when we were in Antarctica as well, we did have, uh, we had a submarine and we mounted a couple of the paralenses on there and they have a free diving mode as well, and we make, which makes sure that the camera starts recording after set that. So yeah. once, the, yeah. once the submarine descended, the camera started uh, rolling. So that awesome. was perfect awesome. for that as well. Um, so, but, but what's really exciting now with Paralens is the new one that they're releasing to the Vaquita. And what Paralens realized when they first come out with the, with the first camera was that this depth and temperature, um, if we can gather that information from all the divers that used it from the specific locations, that's, that's a very valuable database for scientists. You, so you can uh, track global warming or how the oceans are. Prepared. All right, yeah. So the Vaquita now is going to build on uh, citizen science as well. So the camera itself, obviously, is a great camera. Um, and now what the old one didn't have was um, green in the back, but that the old one didn't have that. The new one has that, so it's so it's easier for you to to shoot at. But yeah. the new one has GPS, so it knows exactly where the dive started and ended. Um, it measures salinity as well in the water. Wow. It measures depth and temperature as before. Uh, I think that's it, but it's pretty phenomenal. And then yeah. once you sure. upload your dive to the app, you can choose to share all of these um, measurements with the with the cloud to uh, to parallel, so they can uh, create a whole database with divers all around the world with yeah. all of this valuable mm -hmm. information. And then they share all of this information with all of their partners. That's the first, oh, sorry, that's the second time in a week I've heard that term, citizen science. I quite like that. Yeah. So I was talking to, I'm sure you know, Autumn Blum from Stream yeah. to Sea. I talked to her yeah, last yeah. week, got on with her like an house. I've got an invite to a house. <laughs> no way. Oh, she's yeah. amazing. We, uh, we fourth element are actually distributors for Stream to Yeah, yeah I, I believe so, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm now a wave maker. Hi, yay! <laughs> there you <laughs> go. <Tell me> <laughs> um, I think she took pity on me because I've got ginger hair, and obviously I, I, I get in the sun or a, a bright moon, <laughs> even this light I've got on here, <laughs> and I'll be red. Oh. <coughs> but there um, even, even, there's even a sunscreen with a bit of tint in it, so you can fake the oh, pan as well. Oh, yes. <laughs> <I'm getting, laughs> I can't wait. I'm going to order some of that. Oh, that's brilliant. Um, but the Paralens, with you saying it was a camera developed by divers for divers, does it then um, understand, because of the depth, the colour um, variation or reduction? So does that yeah. automatically sort of filter that in? Yes, it does. You can, even, you can even choose whether or not it's green water or blue water. It changes the white yeah. balance. That's yeah. that's that's pretty special. <laughs> now I know understand why there are a few more pounds than the run of the mill GoPros. Yeah. Guess what? Yeah. It's going in the bin. 
Ah, there you go. No, mate, but make sure you get the new one though, the Vaquita. I'm not, yeah. I'm not even, I think you can get the old one somewhere, but the Vaquita, that's that's the one. Like, Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll hang on for that to come out then, before I uh, bin that. <laughs> uh, speaking of new stuff coming out, obviously you being the rep for Shearwater, they've brought out the uh, the Peregrine, haven't they? Got it right here. Oh, that looks like it's got my name and address on it. That's it. Oh, it has. Oh, yes, yeah, so it has. Get in. <laughs> do, you, do you want me to open it so we can have a look at <laughs> yeah, it? Yeah, go on. Let's do a, an unboxing. Yeah, so it's, uh, and uh, like what I really like, I, again, I'm a bit of a gadget freak, so also boxes and stuff yeah, like I that. Yeah, I love boxes. It's just done so well. So literally, it comes like that, and then you have the little peregrine there. Yeah. I've used it. Yeah. Pharos, I have to say, so it's a bit not virgin, but here no. you go. And hey. then when you turn it on, so the, I don't know if you used Shearwater before. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've, we've both got Shearwater Perdix, me and Ali. Ah, oh, cool. I, I wish I had it here to prove it, and it's downstairs. I promise you we have. That, honestly, we're both diving. <laughs> <I do. laughs> um, but these ones, so the new buttons are like pressure. They're not just sensors. So you yeah. actually like tactile buttons, and it vibrates right. when you yeah. put it on. And it's just like, just like you know it to begin yeah. with. But it's just got such a lovely big color screen and everything. Yeah, that's that's what I like about it the most. It's so easy to read. It's so easy to read. Big numbers, ready to use straight out of the box as well. It's on air mode already. Right. Um, and like, and then it comes with all sorts of lovely things as well. So it comes with the with the strap. It's got on the back here. It's got the pins and screws. It's just so thoughtful. Ooh. Isn't that cool? I need some tools. <laughs> but yeah, right. And then but if if you don't want the straps, you can get the bungee and oh, then okay. and put the bungee on as well. Right, I've got bungees. a question for you then. What? So when I bought mine new, um yeah. from I think I got it from DIR Direct. Yeah. I and it came with a bungee. I've no idea how to thread that. So oh. maybe it's, you need to tell me. I mean obviously so there's it, there's obvious holes, isn't there? But so there's obviously, and it's yeah. there's no exact science on how to do it. Right. So some people do it like loop, like yeah. uh, once on each side, mm -hmm. and then you have you have a double security in that way. Uh, so if one loop breaks, then yeah. the other one is on. But you can also do it continuous thread, so you can cross it around right. and that way. But again, make sure you put two loop uh, two um, knots on it. So yeah. it, in case it um, it um, cracks your computer stays on your arm mm. as well you don't want to lose it no um, and it's got wireless chi charging as well no so, way yeah 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 so the chi charger is here hey. so you just on top and then it charges and nice then one. if you lose if you lose your chi charger you can just use what whichever other you use for your phone nice or whatever as well so it's just it's just an amazing like i know we say it's for a beginner but i mean it's a great recreational computer, though, isn't it? It is, and 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 it's a it's great for a long way up the ladder as well because you can you can have three types of nitrox gases on there as well. So if you go into advanced decompression, you yeah. can still use your Peregrine without having to to upgrade. And if, um, yeah, when you start going tech diving, you know <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of expenses that you need to. Uh, that Absolutely. You need to do they do an AI version, or is there plans for that? Um, at the moment, we started with this, just yeah. as it's no AI and no compass in it, right. just just to make sure we can keep the costs down as well. So we want it, we want it to be an affordable, How much but are they? amazing. So the retail price list in euros is four hundred and eighty-five euros. So what's that in pounds? Let me just do it quick. Do you not know? It's four hundred and twenty-three pounds ninety-nine pence. I know I'm I'm a trained banker, but I have literally <laughs> I have no idea. Yeah, it's 437 quid. Wow, that's not bad at all, is it? No, I, I think so. And then uh, you obviously you can do everything like you can with your other um, share where you still have the app as well, which I find really useful for recording your dives and writing down notes about your equipment and stuff. Hmm. Uh, and the cloud and you can you can even, which I haven't managed to do yet. And again, being the gadget freak that I am, you can customize the splash screen so you can put your own picture in. Well, you jumped the gun there because I was going to say, can you change that screen like I have on mine? Yeah, 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 you can. I've been using the Tarek now for um, for well over a year and I absolutely love the Tarek. 
but I also always feel a bit precious about it. Like I don't want to scratch it and bump mm. it. Uh, but this one is just it's so rugged as well. It's, it's a computer that you don't feel bad no. of leaving in your die bag. I do like the, the idea of the Terry because you could just wear it as a watch and it's got a watch face on it. Yeah. And then you've got absolutely everything else you could possibly want. Yeah. The only, only thing that's probably put me off buying one, and not because I need it right now, but if it had some kind of like fitness part to it, you know, so if you went running, it could monitor yeah. your heart rate, that kind of thing. That that would be the only, if I, if I was after a watch that did everything, that would be the one then, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. It's said uh, you're not the first one saying it. Um, but again, there's only so much you can do put in a computer without making it stupidly expensive. Well, they can do it, but it'd be a million pound. Yeah. <laughs> so it's not happening, but fair yeah. enough. So mission 2020, fourth element. Obviously, you can see him sporting my T-shirt. Yeah. The net effect. Cool. Very um, cool. And I heard about it quite early on, to be honest, earlier this yeah. year. When I, I probably we've probably even met. You know, did you go to the go um, the go dive twenty twenty in Coventry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So okay. I came over to you. So I was after a, a new dry suit. Uh, sorry, a new wetsuit. Yeah. So I got. Um, is it a Proteus two? I bought that. Yeah. Yeah. And I came over, I can't. I honestly can't remember who I spoke to on your stand who directed me to whoever was selling it there. Yeah. Um, and that's where I came into the understanding of what, you know, your mission 2020 was. And obviously I've heard different people talk about it on different, whether it be podcasts or whatever. I think it's great. But, you know, we need to get that out, that, that sort of wording out a little bit more. So what do you want to, what can you tell me? Um, well, I can tell for those who don't know what Mission 2020 is, um, that's, it, it started as something that Fourth Element wanted to do ourselves. So we wanted to make a, a mission for ourselves to do something special for the environment. Obviously, being a manufacturer, we became quite aware of, of how much plastic there is around our products and the packaging and stuff like that. And, and obviously, we are diverse. We work with diverse. We care deeply about the ocean and seeing how much plastic pollution is out there we really felt that something needed to be done and and where else we're better to start than um, by ourselves so jim and paul um started the mission 2020 where the pledge was to eliminate all single-use plastic from our production to try and have a form of recycled component in all future products and to try and reinvent existing products and inform some sort of recycled component in that. Um, nice. So we started doing that ourselves. Um, got on quite well, but at, after a while, uh, Jim and Paul were thinking like, well, it's, it's only a drop in the sea, pardon the pun, if we, we do it ourselves. <laughs> what if we can start this as an industry-wide concept for an industry-wide mission? Mm -hmm. uh, to inspire more people to come and, and more companies and, and fact manufacturers to join this mission as well and then we can actually do something that makes a difference and so we started spreading mission 2020 out further and we've got so many companies on board even competitors santi is on board as well brilliant like Calcium has uh, uh, eliminated single-use plastic um dive centers who are already um, eliminating single-use pl uh, plastics so they instead pledged that they were going to do 50 beach cleanups before 2020 so every it was more of a, of a lifting together thing as an industry working together yeah instead of, uh, for for a common good as well um so 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 far it's obviously uh unfortunately covid has has ruined a bit of uh, of the finish line for us as well okay. uh, there was never really like a real finish line the plan was to to hand over a book with all the pledges from mission 2020 to un on, on world's oceans day but unfortunately we weren't able to attend so that's been delayed um but like just like a company like shearwater joined us and you can see there's no plastic in the packaging no. as well so so really it's just an inspiration that that we as an industry can work together as well for for what we love. Yeah. I think I think having competition is is really healthy. But yeah. when you and you your competitors can work together and collaborate on things, it just sends out a much more bigger and more forceful message, doesn't it? Certainly yeah. with something so important that we all as divers 
because yeah. we all when it all boils down we're all just divers aren't we we just some yeah. work more in the industry i'll get paid for it afterwards i don't get paid for this <laughs> <laughs> shame <laughs> i spend more hours on this than i do at work <laughs> but you know it's, it's it's great that, that i didn't realize that it, i thought it was just within you as a company as in fourth element i didn't realize just how big it had grown yeah no no if you go on mission 2020.org yeah we actually we've removed everything that's called fourth element and uh and made it as a, as a company thing so you can like Sunto is in as well paddy is in ap diving so you got a lot of the big players that have uh, have joined the mission I'm pretty sure Aqualong and Apex are in as well. Um, I'll tell you what, you, it'd get to the point where you'd almost start shaming people to get in that. I don't mean it in a bad way. I mean, oh, we're not on that and we should be. Yeah. And I, I get that if somebody's just bought, as a new company, 40,000 plastic bags, they really need to use them because as a new company, they probably can't afford to get rid of them. But if yeah. at, at, at 40,000 and one is a paper bag or recycled yeah. plastic bag, or a biodegradable one, yeah. surely, you know, if they've got that ball rolling and they can see that in the distance, you yeah. know, it'd be a great thing, really. I don't mean to shame people into that. You know what I mean? Though, if we, we, We're not yeah. part of that and we should be, yeah. you know, so maybe... They... That's that's another thing that we've done as well. Like, we've like we've been around at all the shows that we've done. We're trying to talk to other companies and, uh, and they might say, like, well, we, we don't know even where to start. And then you're like, just come and have a chat with us. We're happy to tell you where we bought our like paper bags or the yeah. bags that we package us when we're in and stuff like that. So we're happy. We're happy to guide you in the wrong direction and provide the advice on how to do it. Um, and then again, like there's the website as well. So so also not to scare away competitors as well because it's, yeah. it's a common project. Um, but yeah, but it's it's been really it's it's been amazing to see how many uh, are on board. Um, and hopefully it's an inspiration to get more people on board as well. Absolutely. When yeah. my hoodie and a couple of t-shirts came a couple of weeks ago, all in a nice little paper bag, it it looked right as well. You know, it didn't look like you just thrown it in some paper bag. It looked, you know, absolutely right for the products I was buying. <laughs> and then even because of what I wear for work, like a t-shirt, I get quite really, you know, heavy heavy knit ones I think is the best way of putting it so yeah. when they came and these were quite thin I was thinking I've paid a little bit more for these but then when you actually put them on and you feel the quality yeah they're even better yeah so it, it's a crazy thing in it to think that by doing something good you're actually getting a better quality yeah and, and doing uh, something like good. It, yeah the prints are water-based as well so it's so like we're trying to and I don't know if you notice like even the Kimball tag has been removed the plastic Kimball oh yeah tag yeah yeah I do yeah instead yeah there's there's been a lot of trial and error I have to <laughs> as well. <laughs> we did uh we did try first with the cassava bags but then we found out they, they they can't handle too cold so the packaging itself will crack really so yeah but like somebody has someone has and it's been an expensive journey for us but mm. again that's that's like someone yeah someone has to start somewhere and then it's by trial and error we learn mm. and we're happy to to share out the the experiences that we've had along the way that's ace. Well, that's a nice segue using the word trial and error because throughout my limited four years of diving, I've done quite a few dives in different areas, in different scenarios, different settings or whatever. And my trial and error is trying to keep warm. I'm horrendous at keeping warm. Now, certainly now I've got, as a better diver, I'm more still in the water, probably kicking a lot less. I'm yeah. trying to take, certainly if I take my macro lens in, you know what that's like. You just sat still yeah. doing nothing. Yeah. And I tend to go in the colder months because no one wants to go with me so I'm quite happy on my own just sitting there trying to do what I'm doing but I freeze my absolute nuts off I'm the same I get cold as well yeah. um and as a standalone suit it's not warm enough so you still need to layer up underneath mm. um but uh, but it's definitely something to hold I think for. I, I was I was convinced a few years ago I, I like a full suit I don't like a top and bottom yeah which is the only reason I didn't buy because all my mates dive the fourth element top and bottom I've got the yeah. socks and I love them. Um, yeah. But because sometimes I might reach up or I might be doing valve drills or something, a bit of my belly will hang out, so I get cold. <laughs> so somebody, I'd asked around maybe on Facebook and I ended up with the Quark, um, yeah. I think it's called Quark Navel or whatever. Yeah. Um, so one with the red stitching. And yeah. I love that. But I think over time through washing, I'm being compressed over and over. It's got a little cold. 
So it's yeah. not an all all round all year round one for me. Certainly summer, yeah. I'm absolutely fine. But as soon as I get into winter, I need more and more layers. Yeah. And and but that's that's, that, that's what I do with my like. So I'm I dive Arctic um, mm. in ninety percent of my dives, and then I layer up or down depending on the temperature. If okay. uh, if like when we go to Mexico, I'm bringing my dry suit. I always bring my dry suit to Mexico. Water has to be above 25 Celsius before I get out of my dress suit. Yes. <laughs> I absolutely hate being cold. And, uh, and when, it's, when it's cold, uh, I wear literally all my layers. So really? it's J2, the Serotherm, the X-Core Vest. And if yeah. you do feel a bit cold, I would recommend getting the X-Core Vest just because if you can get some more core heat, that will really help with the overall comfortability yeah. of your dive. And it's not too expensive as well instead of changing out your entire yeah, well, uh, I uh, I trialed some gear for Northern Diver earlier yeah. this year because they yeah. brought out um, Electricore. They brought an Electricore vest out, and it's only about eighty quid. Yeah. So it's it's literally just a tank top with a zip and a small battery. Yeah. So my plan would be in in the winter, certainly for my my core to to wear yeah. something like that. Um, but I've got my gloves right now. I think you know I've got I've got a bigger one. I, I wear the Kubi dry gloves. Yeah. Um, so I've got layered up and they're big enough so I can get them all on and they're yeah. not too what tight. Of, what kind of undergloves do you use? So I've got the, obviously the standard cotton ones that come with the marigolds that come with the Kubi. I bought the yeah. ice, the new Icelandic wool ones. Yeah, from they're Kubi. Nice. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've, I had my eye out for them. I haven't been diving dry gloves much lately. Um, it's just been, you know, I've been doing a lot of, of, uh, of open water diving with a single tank and some friends yeah. who aren't really are very comfortable in water so it's just yeah. been short dives anyway yeah um, but i'm uh, obviously we we do make uh, the serotherm gloves and the glove liners but i think when you go for for the more extreme dives uh, they're not entirely enough so yeah. i'm always interested to hear what other people are using now, i did see the ones from the from from kubi the atlantic rules and always it speaks to my heart as well being fairy so anything yeah. that comes from a natural source and way up north uh, Absolutely. Well, I've gone to, so I've worn the, the ones that come with the cuff system yeah. with those Icelandic wool ones over the top and then the thicker, sort of more rugged outer gloves. Yeah. Um, I've even tried just wearing the marigolds to keep my hands dry with a pair of neoprene yeah. over the top. Um, which ones have I got now? I've got the waterproof ones with the sort of orange flap with the zip there. Yeah. It didn't really work. I didn't feel any benefit, to be honest. Um, I'm up for trying anything just to to see what I can achieve, you know, because, but I've yeah. heard of people wearing two or three hoods to try and keep their head warm. Yeah. I, I love my fourth element hood, to be honest. I'm probably ready for getting a thicker one for winter. Yeah. But, you know, it's because it was short. That's what I liked about it, because some of them flip over, don't they, around the neck and yeah. that. I like looking cool. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's the thing that's also why i like four filament so much it's how swishy that everything looks as well swish <laughs> well it's, it's almost fashion and function i'd suggest because a lot of stuff whether it be diving or whatever is fashion over function yeah Certainly my children who are like early 20s now yeah um everything is fashionable there's no functionality one of them wants a 600 pound pair of trainers that look like socks and I'm like, what do you want them for? Because you'll never want to wear them. It looks like socks. Yeah, they're called Balenciagas. Have a Google of that. Oh, they're horrendous. <laughs> oh. And I'm like, what do you want them for? Honestly, they're just horrendous. Uh, that's what I'm thinking. Like, think of all the dive equipment you can buy for 600 pounds. Well, yeah. And that's the thing as well. Like, and, and because we are all so different divers as well. And people, people ask, like, what kind of undergarment should I use? And I'm like, what? <laughs> it's it's just the broadest question ever because as you said yourself like when you start off diving you're more active and then you keep your like you keep warm uh, easier yeah. but then you you get better and then you you're calmer as well which puts takes puts your air consumption down but then it makes you so much colder because you're not kicking around all the time as well no. Yeah. And then you end up like layering up and then you need extra weight and like, oh, and then you go from fresh to salt and then <laughs> rebreather to side mound. And that's oh. why I like the, having the app with the, the weights, especially the weights, is the one yeah. that I have every dive. I need to look at my notes and, and consult my notes and figure out how much weight I need. That, that's one thing I've tried to push with anyone I've 
been teaching as an instructor oh. is every time you change it, either your configuration or what you're wearing, yeah. make a note of it in your dive log because you'll always refer back to that. Yeah. And I think there's there's a lot to be said for having them kind of notes that yeah. you know you can't forget then really. Short no, of exactly. just getting it completely wrong. Right, yeah. so we'll start wrapping it up then. So I, yeah. I, you might have noticed I tagged you on a few things to, this afternoon on Facebook and Instagram and all the rest of it. Yeah. I got one question off a, a good friend of mine that comes on. He chats to me all the time about when I put stuff on YouTube and Instagram and that. But obviously he was, he was asking, where did, how did it all begin and what, how did you get into diving, which was going to get covered anyway. Mm. Then a couple of my mates who run another podcast, he said, ask her, what's her favourite fish? That's such a good question. I never thought about that. Does the cuttlefish count? Well, it's not really a fish though, isn't it? It's got fish um, in its name. That'll do for me. Yeah. <laughs> no, but the cuttlefish is probably one of the, the things that I love watching most. And then like when you ask fish, but it's but it's mm. instead of favorite, it's the one I hate. It's the trigger fish, the Titan trigger fish. I absolutely yeah. hate that fish. Why? <laughs> have you even have you ever dined with one? Not knowingly. They're, oh, they're just little bastards. They're just so <laughs> They're horrible. They're, 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 so they're, the triggerfish is, uh, they live uh, uh, down south. So they're in Indonesia and yeah. in Thailand and stuff like that. So all over the, uh, Southeast Asia. Um, they're, they're absolutely stunning fish, which kind of makes it a lot worse that they're such bastards. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they're so beautiful and they're big. But what they do is that they eat coral reefs. So they have beaks. Yeah. Um, and when they nest, they have their nests on the, on the ground floor of the, of the, of the bay. Uh, of the of the ocean, um, and their territory goes up like a cone. Okay. And they're extremely territorial. So if once if they're in their nesting area and you swim over their cone, which just gets bigger and bigger, um, they will come up and charge you, and they're like straight into <laughs> your face, and it's like so, and like they're not lethal in any sort of way, but they just no. give you the biggest fright. Right. Yeah. I've heard of people where like they like give it like give bit a little bit of, of the knuckle or just a teeny tiny bit of the ear no or something like that. Yeah. But if you can, so they have, so that's why they're called a trigger because they have like a like a little fin on the neck right so when they, when they lift that one they're agitated so if, if you see a big trigger fish and it's kind of looking at you swimming around the guarding his territory just just turn around the direction i didn't think we'd get such a cool answer to such a bone question <laughs> <laughs> what's but your favorite fish your answer i so that's my that's my least favorite fish yeah. but it's still like the first one that pops into my mind Please, please stay in touch and then uh, generally if you do come down and let me know. And, I will. Be yeah. mate. Nice one. Right, take it easy. Have a good evening. Yeah. I'll you see too. you later. Thanks very much. Bye. Take it easy. Bye-bye. So that brings us to an end of episode 22, my friend Ramva Jorbenson. Links to all the things we discussed in the podcast notes. My guest on episode 23 are Blakey and Wazza, the rogue divers. They talk about discovering plane wreckage, shark tagging and trips to the Red Sea. You've been listening to Are You A Scooby Diver Fancy Every Podcast with me, Andy the Northern Diver. You can find more scuba related content on my YouTube channel. The link is in the podcast notes. If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider subscribing and leaving us a five star review. If there's someone or something you'd like us to discuss, let us know via our Facebook page. Thanks for listening. See you on the next one.